All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know it's a little bit after 8 o'clock, but kind of wanted to give everybody a second just to kind of get where they were going. My name is Camp Han. I'm a cotton agronomist uh, based here out of Tifton. It's good to be here this morning. Glad everybody made it to the early session. All right, so we're going to get started off right, I hope. Um, first thing, I got three things I want to talk about, okay? First is going to be varieties, and that's going to take up the majority of my talk, and then there's two short things at the end. But if you've heard me talk about varieties before, you've uh, heard me talk about the on-farm program, okay? And that's where we're focusing in on a handful of varieties across a wide range of environments, and this past year was no exception, with about 25 locations evaluated uh, in 2023. Now this is the variety list that we looked at this past year. A couple of uh, notes to make about the list. The first uh, is that one of the newer varieties is Delta Pine 2333. That's a new variety from Delta Pine. It was uh, newly released last year and this year from what I understand there's going to be a little bit more seed for it. And then Dynagrow 3528 was also new to the trial in 2023. Okay, these varieties are planted in grower fields, managed using their practices, um, and then at the end of the year, whenever it's harvested, we take a seed cotton sample and bring it back to Tifton. We gin it at the microgen and get fiber quality data as well. And these are the results for 2023, okay? From left to right, we got variety, lint yield, statistics, and then the percent of times that these varieties are yielding above average, okay? Now, I like to talk about this variety stability uh, part of things really because uh, some years some of the varieties that we plant a lot of may not quite do what they've been doing in the past, okay, for one reason or another. Um, so I'm going to stress stability a lot uh, throughout this talk and I like to use the above average uh, measure for stability just because you always want to plant a variety that does above average. Whether it's in your poor ground or in your good ground, you want something that's going to do above average, right? So that's, uh, that's kind of why I like to look at it that way. Now, one other thing to note is that really from top to bottom, you got about 150 pounds, a little more than 150 pounds of difference between these 10 varieties. So they're all performing well, okay? But there are some that kind of stand out among the rest of them. Okay, those four that are in bold at the top, that was our top yielding group this past season. And really looking at that, you got 31 pounds of difference between those four varieties. Those are all performing well also. But again, want to stress stability and looking over to the far right, what you kind of see is that Delta Pine 2038 on up to the top. Those are our more consistent varieties. Those are the ones that are performing above average over half the time. Okay, and some of them are doing a little better uh, than others in that category, all right? Now this is the big slide. I'm sure uh, most of you have seen it. If you hadn't, it's available at ugacotton.com, so you can go find it there. Get in touch with your local county agent, they can get it to you as well. But there's really two things that I wanna point out about this slide. Um, the first is that this past year's trial average was 1,248 pounds, which was up slightly from the year before, okay? And that trial average is, marked by that red line between Worth and Coffee County. So from Worth County to the left was a below average yield environments and from Coffee County to the right was above average yield environments, okay? Now the other thing that I think is kind of interesting is that in the past few years, if you've seen these results, one thing that may grab your attention is that we see some dry land locations there in the top, okay, in some of our top yield environments. And this year, by and large, our South Georgia locations demonstrated that we saw a benefit to irrigating cotton, okay? Uh, our dry land locations were, by and large, some of our lower yielding locations, and then irrigation definitely improved yield. Now, there's always an exception to the rule, okay? Um, there's one location there at the very top, okay, and it's uh, Watkinsville, Georgia. And I know that a lot of people here in this room may not have been there. May maybe Laura's the only one that knows exactly where I'm talking about. But uh, we do a variety trial up there every year, and this year it just hit up there. The stars aligned. Uh, it was a great year for those guys. They, uh, they were tickled to death. I was talking to some of them last night. They said, man, when you come up to Morgan County for your meeting, we're going we're gonna to just celebrate. You know, we had a good year. And they averaged, a lot of those guys averaged 14, 1,500 pounds. So, and that just doesn't happen up there. They're 100% dry land. The rain fell right and the stars aligned for those guys. Okay. 
I do like to separate it into our below average yield environments and above average yield environments as well, just to kind of see if something rises to the top there. But really it's pretty consistent. That's our top yielding group, those bolded varieties from 37.99 up to 50.91. But again, looking at the stability measure, you look from Stoneville 45.95 up to the top, those are our more consistent varieties in below average yield environments. And then in our above average yield environments, we see something pretty similar to the overall results where the, we have the same top four. It's just rearranged a little bit, okay? But again, those are all performing at a high level, 60 to 100% of the time yielding above average, all right? Now, I kind of alluded to this, but you want a variety that's stable across geography, but you also want something that's stable over time. You want a variety that's going to stand the test of time to a certain extent, right? And uh, so I want to look at multiple years and multiple environments. So this is the last two years, 46 locations, okay? And there was only eight common varieties across the last two years, but really those top seven didn't really separate out much. And those, that's our top yielding group over two years, and we see about 60 pounds of difference in those seven varieties. But again, honing in on stability, and this is demonstrating over time and environments too, you got 61% of the time up to 83 all right, so from 45.95 up to the top, those are our more consistent varieties. All right, now one thing that I had, I already showed your slide, Mr. Lee. I, I was bragging on you guys up there in uh, Oconee and Morgan County, so I, I uh, was bragging on y'all just a second ago. But one thing I hadn't done uh, historically is look at the three-year averages, okay, because these varieties turn over so fast, it's pretty rare for me to get a chance to look at them for three years in a row. All right, these companies switch out these varieties on me. They're looking at new stuff and they want to see how it's doing against the competition. But this past year we had five uh, varieties that had been in the trial for the last three years. And these are the averages for those. Now one thing you'll notice is that Dynagro 3799 worked its way back up to the top over three years, okay? But the one thing that I want to point out is that Stonewall 59 was a little more consistent, yielding above average 80% of the time over the last three years, okay? But again, those top four, that's our top yielding group over three years, and they're still performing consistently. Over half the time, all of them are performing above average, okay? Any questions in the on-farm program before I move into a couple of other things on varieties? You can't find those in here. Okay. No, none of these uh, for the last, for at least the last three years have been Thrive On. This past year was the first year that it was commercialized, and so they didn't put it in the trial because they weren't quite 100% sure what was going to happen regulatory-wise, but I do have a little bit of Thrive On data. And so we can, yep, we can talk about that for certain. So <clears throat> the other thing I like to show whenever it's available is the OVT data, all right? So this is a small plot variety trial program and their focus is more on varieties and less on environment, okay? So we're talking a few, a handful of locations, Tifton Plains, Midville, and Bainbridge, Georgia, and they looked at 45 varieties, all right? Now, if I showed a slide with data from 45 varieties, it'd be so, so, so small that Philip couldn't read it, right? Philip, it'd be too small, okay? So we're, we're, I tried to consolidate it just a little bit and just show the above average yielding varieties this past year, okay? The OVT average in 2023 was 1,433 pounds per acre. And so all the varieties that are listed here yielded above that average, all right? A few observations that I have on the OVT data. The first is that nine out of the 10 varieties that we evaluated on farm in 2023 are also listed on this slide, okay? So that tells me that those varieties are performing consistently in the on-farm program and also in the OVT program, okay? The only reason it's not 10 out of 10 is because Delta Pine 2038 was not included in the OVT program, and if it had been, it'd probably be 10 out of 10, okay? Now, the other thing I like to point out is that on this slide, we have two nematode varieties and three Thrive On varieties, okay? The nematode varieties are Delta Pine 2349. That's a fairly new one from them, and it's root knot resistant and bacterial blight. And then uh, Phytogen 415, I believe that's a fairly new one from them as well. It's root knot, reniform, and bacterial blight resistant as well, all right? And then the Thrive On varieties were all uh, Delta Pine, the Delta Pine 2131, 2211, 
and 2328. And that T in there designates a thrive on variety compared to the others. But I really like this program a lot. I, I put a lot of stock in it. And really, uh, when I use it is whenever I get calls from county agents and they say, hey, you know, a grower came to me and they want to plant a variety that you hadn't tested. What do we do? And so I'll look here and look at what growers normally plant and kind of stack it up against those. And then we can kind of make a decision on what we're going to go with uh, moving forward. So those full results are available at swvt.uga.edu if you ever uh, want to look at that, okay? But I do um, some small plot variety work of my own, do some PGR work with it, and uh, the reason that I do that is because, like I mentioned earlier, these varieties are just turning over so fast that we got to learn how to manage them quick before they take them off the market, okay? So I do these little trials and uh, compare a bunch of varieties. This past year it was 18 and we looked in two planting dates in Tifton, one in Midville and one in Atapalgus, and we picked that trial every year. Okay, so uh, I saw some pretty neat stuff in the yield this time and I just wanna share a little bit of that with y'all. Okay, now this is averaged across four locations, all right? And everything to the left of that red line was above average and that was our top yielding group as well, okay? Everything to the right was below average and did statistically a little bit uh, lower than the varieties on the left, all right? Now, a couple observations that I have. The first is the Thrive On varieties, okay? I only looked at three of them this past time. Delta Pine 2131, Dinah Grove 4484, and Delta Pine 2211, all right? Now, if you remember, that red line was right here between 2127 and 2131, okay? So all of our Thrive On varieties were below average and they weren't quite in that top yielding group, okay? Now, the take home on this one is that the Thrive On varieties are close, but they're not quite there yet, okay? And everybody in this room has seen technology change with seed over time, all right? And we all know that eventually these traits wind up in an elite germplasm, okay? So I don't have any doubt that Thrive On is gonna be in elite varieties one day, okay? but I don't believe that that day is today. Now, if you're going to plant Dynagrow or Delta Pine or Armor or Next Gen, one day you ain't going to have a choice. They're moving 100% Thrive On. But today we have that choice, okay? Correct. Correct, yes. All right, next thing. Unfortunately, I'm talking at the same time as Bob. And so if y'all if y'all want to go hear him this afternoon, go hear him. But if you go listen to him this afternoon, he's going to try to scare everybody, okay? He's going to try to scare everybody into planting a nematode variety, all right? And I have gotten phone calls from county agents after <laughs> Bob talks, and the question is, man, he scared these folks, all right? Should, he just, should these growers just plant nematode varieties across the whole farm, okay? And my answer to that is I think that's a little extreme, okay? And I don't think that's what Bob's trying to accomplish, okay? I looked at three nematode varieties this past year, and it did not matter the company that released it, the herbicide you can spray over it, or whatever, all three of them wound up at the bottom, okay? So, my take home on this is that nematode varieties are a good management option for nematode fields, okay? And I think that's what Bob would tell you, okay? Now, the thing is, this is textbook variety selection right here. Putting a variety in a position to be successful. Nematode varieties shine on nematode ground, okay? Now, how do you know if you have a nematode problem? You got a sample, right? You got to pull a nematode sample, okay? So, pull you a nematode sample if you think you have a problem. If you do, you should try one, okay? That's what I would do, all right? So, last little bit on varieties. Um, we did talk about Thrive On just a little bit. Um, you know, if you go here, Dr. Roberts, he may talk about it a little bit more, but it's a BT trait in cotton, all right? It helps you with thrips and tarnished plant bugs. Gist of it is, it's dynamite on thrips, helps you a little bit on plant bugs, okay? It's not gonna eliminate plant bugs, it's just gonna help, all right? So. One thing as far as Thrive On, you're not gonna put out ag lobby. Hmm. This would push, to me, it would push a grower, especially planting herbs, to go with a Thrive On variety. Wouldn't that make a big difference? In thrips control for certain, yeah, for certain. So that's 
that's a good point to make. And, you know, we still, I, we still got a lot to learn about it because last year was the first year that really it was widely available. But, uh, and like I said, the varieties do have some catching up to do, but really the fit for Thrive On, for me anyways, is going to be your early planting stuff. If you're going to plant some, plant some cotton in April, if you, yeah, if you're going to use Ag Logic for nematodes, don't plant Thrive On, okay? Because you're, you're wasting your money, pretty much. But if you got a field that you don't have a nematode problem on and you're planting early, take a look at it. It's really good, okay? So the main benefit is going to be when you plant early, all right? You should, 2131, there's a handful of varieties, but in my stuff, 2131 did a little bit better. Okay. Right. Right. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it'll tell on you. It'll tell on you bad. I mean, it's a, it's a really good thrips technology. I mean, just plain and simple. It'll look like you put Ag Logic out when you did. I mean, that's. It may be, just a hair, all right? Next thing that's pretty new um, that we hadn't talked a ton about uh, is this Axant Flex technology, all right? That's new from Stoneville. It's a new herbicide trait from them. It's cotton that is tolerant to a corn herbicide, which is great, right? It's going to help us out a lot with pigweed. It's going to help us out a lot with morning glory. It's going to help us out a lot with uh, volunteer peanuts. It does really good on that, okay? There's one new variety that has the trait, and it's called Stonville 6000 AXTP. That's the name of the variety. It's root knot nematode resistant and bacterial blight as well. All right. Now all that stuff sounds really good, doesn't it? And it's going to help you out with all this stuff, and it's this new technology. Man, it's great. The problem is that the herbicide ain't registered. Okay. So please do not go to your dealer and say, hey, I want the new Stonville variety, and I want the new herbicide that comes with it because we ain't going down that road again, okay? If you want to try the variety, try some if it's available, but don't try to spray the herbicide over it, okay? We, uh, we have a lot to learn about these varieties. I only had one trial with them this past time, so my experience is limited, but um, we're gonna learn more about their potential fit and uh, all that good stuff in, in this year and moving forward, okay? Because that's the way their pipeline is moving, all right? Any questions on varieties before I get to the last two things here? Okay. Microbial products, everybody's got one, yeah? All the big companies are selling them. The big companies like Bayer, BASF, Corteva, they have branches of their company that's dedicated to this stuff, okay? Um, so, and I have some thoughts on that. I think that it's easier to bring one of these products to market than it is a traditional chemistry, and that's probably why uh, these companies are moving this direction. But these products are marketed to improve nutrient uptake, nutrient use efficiency, crop health, vigor, um, Seth, whatever ails you, they can help, okay? That's kind of what it seems like to me, all right? Now, there's been a big push. It always starts in corn and soybeans and then it works its way to us, you know, the poor old cotton folks, right? So. This past year, they, I mean, it had made a big push in the cotton market, and so we uh, did a beltwide project, and me and Dr. Snyder and uh, Dr. Henry Sintem down the hallway, we all kind of worked together on this. And it was from Virginia out to Arizona. We did an experiment on these. And we looked at, it says five, but we did six microbial products applied with 40 pounds of nitrogen to the acre, and we compared that to five standard nitrogen rates, okay? And these are the data from Tifton, all right? There's two things that I want to point out here, okay? The first is that if you grab a production guide, which I think uh, one of my helpers brought in here, Montana, she said them in the back if you want one. Um, in the production guide, the recommended nitrogen rate for cotton in Georgia is about, if you're going to shoot for three bale, is 105 pounds of nitrogen to the acre, okay? So our highest yield in treatment was 120 pounds of nitrogen to the acre, just over four bale, okay? Love it when a study works out and pretty much justifies a recommendation, don't you, Dr. Snyder? That, that's always a good thing, okay? But if these products are doing what they say they're supposed to do, these microbial products, they would do better than 40 pounds of nitrogen by itself, all right? All the products plus 40 pounds are over here on the right, and then 40 pounds of nitrogen by itself is right there, okay? And statistically speaking, none of these products improved yield over 40 pounds by itself, okay? Now, 
Y'all are probably sitting here thinking, oh, he's just bashing these products. No, that's not what I'm trying to do, okay? I'm not trying to bash these specific ones or any other ones or anything like that, okay? If you go listen to an, econ uh, an economics talk later today, you might leave a little sad, okay? Because the outlook is not great, <laughs> all right? Cotton price, I think, uh, this morning, it's about 81 cents if you book for the center, all right? Margins are gonna be razor thin this time. Okay, and it has been for the last few years. So the reason I'm talking about this is because I want for you guys to go and put your money and your inputs into stuff that we're confident we're going to get a return on. Okay, and I've looked at a lot of these products, whether it's microbials or stress mitigators or uh, what biostimulants, whatever it is, and I have not seen a benefit to using them on cotton, plain and simple. Okay, so maybe let's take that money and use it on something that we're confident we're going to get a return on, okay? I hadn't priced any of them, but I mean, spending money on something you ain't getting anything out of ain't worth it to me, all right? Anybody want to guess what I got a lot of calls about this time? There's a few people that know. It, Lee knows, Lee, Lee knows, it's deer. Anybody, get, anybody got a deer problem? Anybody? Yeah, a handful? Okay. I thought I had the deer figured out. It turns out I'm a dummy, okay? Because I, I thought, you know, historically looking back at the planting times in Georgia and stuff like that, you know, in May and June it dries out historically. And then we kind of get back into July and start training again. Well, I thought that whenever it dried out in May and June, all the browse in the woods died and then the deer would move to the stuff that's actively growing, which would be crops in the field, cotton, peanuts, whatever it is, okay? Well, this past year that didn't happen, and that's kind of what proved me wrong, all right? It stayed cool, it stayed raining the whole time. The browse in the woods, in my opinion, should have lasted a little bit longer and kept them in the woods, and that didn't happen. It, I got a lot more calls about it than I have in the past couple years, okay? Now, I'm going around to county meetings and I'm trying to collect data on this, all right, survey data, really just to try to get a number because at the end of the day, um, what a lot of the policy makers and county agents and stuff like that have told me is that the biggest hindrance on the deer thing is that we don't have a number, all right? So, you come to your county meeting and I'll give out a survey and fill it out whenever you're there. And I'll try to get that number for us to try to get some help, all right? But really, that's going to help with getting some kind of FSA or insurance help or even some kind of legislative action to do something. I don't know exactly what it's going to lead to, but hopefully it's going to lead to something productive. Now, I say all that to say that we're starting to spend a lot of time on this, okay? Because it just kind of hit a point last year that it's like, all right, we got to at least do something, all right? Now, y'all are sitting here thinking, you say, Cam, what are you really going to do about the deer? And that's a great question because next year, if whenever we come to this meeting, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to stand up here and say, hey, we did it. You know, we fixed it, right? That's just not how it works, okay? But I'm trying to do research on stuff to try to get some help. And that's really what it comes down to, okay? If you go listen to anybody else today, whether it's Kim Wright or Dr. Roberts or Dr. Harris or, or Dr. Culpepper, they will tell you how much you are losing to their pests that they study, okay? And the data is hard numbers, all right? We don't have that for deer, okay? So Lance, raise your hand, Lance. Lance is my new graduate student, and he's going to be the deer man, and his project is going to be trying to figure out how much we're losing to deer, okay? So, large undertaking for Lance, but hey, he's a, good, he's a, good, he's a young man, got a lot of energy, so he, he can do it, I believe in him, all right? Um, another thing, you know, in some of our bigger fields, how far are they venturing into those fields? And, you know, I know that we've talked about, hey, they're just going to get in there and they're going to do what they're going to do. You know, the average field size in Georgia is about 30 acres, so in some of those cases, they're just going to take it all. But, you know, maybe that's going to help with some of our management strategies. Uh, repellent work, we've started some of that, looking at different products, application frequencies, stuff like that. And then also, if you've been in cotton a long time, you may tell me, hey, they didn't used to eat cotton, okay? And I believe you, okay? But I wonder if something has happened with the deer population to where maybe they prefer cotton. And maybe there's something in the cotton plant that they prefer over other things nutritionally, all right? So 
those are some things that we're going to start looking at, but I do want to stress that for now we're researching how to live with a problem, okay? It's going to be a long road to try to fix it, but it is, uh, it, we're researching how to live with this problem. And if you have any suggestions other than just shooting a bunch of them that I can actually research, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, of course, I want to thank you guys for coming this so early. I want to thank the commission for everything that they do. That's grower-funded organization, so we wouldn't be able to do the kind of things we're talking about without you guys. Um, any quick questions for me while I get Dr. Snyder's stuff pulled up? Yes, sir. So that's what I do the picks work for. Uh, if you go and look at like uh, the 5091 and 9831 are probably going to be the more aggressive varieties. 2333 from Delta Pine and 4595 aren't quite as aggressive. So those varieties I may would, you know, it's a little easier to rein those in than it is the 5091. 5091 would be comparable to Delta Pine 2038 or something like that. So, and we can talk about that. Uh, more too if you want. I got a little more uh, data on stuff like that. Um, well good morning everyone. My name is John Snyder. I'm a cotton physiologist here at the University of Georgia in Tifton. And so before I get started, you know, I want to talk briefly about what physiology is. You know, what we do is we try to learn more about how the plant operates, how the plant responds, whether it's to environmental conditions, management practices, and what have you. It's all about learning more about plant function. So we work on everything from, you know, looking at the seedling stage, looking at things that affect seedling vigor, whether that's seed traits and what have you, um, you know, all the way out to, you know, also looking at, for example, irrigation management, looking at uh, 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 response to fertility and just any number of things that you can think of. But what I want to do today, I want to keep this talk, this is going to be a much more focused talk because I'm going to talk about some of the observations that we, that we uh, well, some observations we made specifically in, in our irrigation research trials down in Camilla, Georgia. So anybody who's here, one of the things Kent mentioned is that other than one location, it was a really good year to show that separation between the dry land sites and the irrigated sites, right? And especially in southwest Georgia, um, you know, we really saw that yield reduction as a function of drought stress, particularly during that peak bloom to cutout phase, at least for some of our trials. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And so I always start this off and I, I present the same picture and every year I'm here, I'm always saying, well, you know, on this screen, it doesn't really look that great, but I still keep the same picture because I'm not that good at taking new pictures. But what this shows is really the effects of drought stress on the cotton crop. Um, you know, here you've got a closed canopy. This is just showing from a well water to the kind of a transition zone on a pivot for some of our research plots to a drought stress treatment. And there's multiple things that you see here. You can see that the canopy, of course, is more, well, we got a more full canopy, meaning that crop is capturing more light uh, than a crop over here where there's a whole lot of the row middle uh, exposed. Uh, also, the crop that's got a more full canopy has more fruiting sites. And one of the things you can see, you can see severe wilting, but also you can see these white flowers at the top of the plant, right? And so what that tells you is that that crop, that drought stress crop is cutting out prematurely, right? And so all of that spells reductions in yield. So that reduction in yield could either be because you have that smaller canopy and there's fewer fruiting sites, or even after we develop a, a, a fully closed canopy, uh, if we get severe drought stress, you can still get, you'll get that wilting, you'll see that stress will be visible, but you'll also see reductions in fruit retention, right? So you can have a, a very well-developed canopy, but if you get drought in the later season, you still will get reductions in fruit retention and you get lower yields either way, okay? And so this last season, I think, kind of describes that, that later situation. And we'll talk more about that as we go along here, okay? So... Water excess, one of the things we've documented over and over is in wet years, you can actually occasionally penalize yield with irrigation. Now, when I say that, are the yield penalties as drastic as they are under drought? And the answer is no, they're much smaller, but you can actually penalize yield with irrigation by watering too much. And why is it? Well, this crop right here in its native environment is a perennial plant, meaning you know, in theory, if, if it was living out in the Bahamas, it would essentially just, just live forever, right? Year after year after year. And so 
To be competitive, that plant's going to get as big as it can, right? Outcompete neighboring plants, and then it's going to worry about reproduction, okay? And so if we over irrigate and combine that with other things, other management practices like high nitrogen rates and so on, that plant will get huge and it'll get basically you'll have a lot of vegetative growth but at the expense of reproductive growth. So these are the kind of the, the balancing act there and of course that's why we use plant growth regulators as well uh, in cotton. But what I want to do now is I want to talk to you about uh, some, some irrigation research that we did uh, in Camilla, Georgia at the Irrigation Research Park there. And these trials, I've got three separate experiments that we did at the same site and this was for cotton that was planted under the, at the same time it was harvested at the same time and it was managed the same except you know with the exception of, of irrigation okay because it's an irrigation research site so we had different irrigation treatments okay uh, but let's talk a little bit about the 2023 weather conditions at that site uh, let's go ahead and start with temperature so one of the things everyone's familiar everyone knows is it was hot last year, especially when we get over into July, we get over into August. And so we, you know, kind of over in this time frame, and, and I'll explain what these dashed lines are later. I'm going to kind of leave it vague for now. But if you look at the temperature trends here that we pulled off the weather station, you can see that it's the, you know, the daytime temperatures were somewhere between 95 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. Okay. Uh, and the thing is, that cotton crop can actually stay substantially cooler than that air temperature. It may just be hovering around the optimal temperature. Um, but to do that, what does the crop have to do? The crop has to lose a lot of water, right? So as that water is lost from those leaf surfaces, it cools the canopy below the air, okay? But when you've got high temperatures like this, you've got a full canopy, you've got high temperatures, that crop is losing a lot of water, okay? To, and, and not just to keep itself cool, but in general, it's losing more water to the environment, okay? And now, I wanna also show this trend. So this is just showing our rainfall trends. You can see in the early season, where we had a few large rainfall events, maybe a few dry periods at this site, but uh, the crop is really small during this time frame. So when we go from planting to about squaring uh, over here, uh, that crop is not, it's nowhere near a closed canopy. It's not losing as much water to the environment, right? So the demands are lower. But over in here, those, that's that same, I've got those dashed lines there for a reason, okay? But we'll, we'll get to that. But I want you to notice something. That right about, you know, right about that peak bloom phase, somewhere near late, late July, early August, we had this extended period where there was very little rainfall. In fact, we had nearly two weeks somewhere in that neighborhood where there was no rainfall. So a pretty dry period at the time. So dry, hot, and of course the crop is a lot bigger, right? So the potential for drought stress is pretty high, okay? So under these conditions, I had a few experiments that we did, and I want to walk you through some of those, okay? So I'm going to show you some of the lint yield data first. And I am, I'm leaving some of this deliberately vague because I got some questions I want you to answer, all right? But if you look here, I've got, so this is dry land, this is irrigated, the variety is 2127. I think we saw that in one of your lists, maybe the PGR list, I think. Um, but if you look here, you know, we lost about 700 pounds a yield due to drought. And this drought, again, was just from peak bloom to cutout, all right? About 700 pounds. And you know, this yields here, we're looking at a little over, I think it's between 1,600 and 1,700 pounds to the acre. So really good yields, right? Under irrigated conditions. All right, if we look over here, all right, Dynagro 3799, that's another one of those that ranked pretty well when we looked at it over the last three years of on-farm trials, right? Um, it's ranking changed a little this year, but still we're going from, again, these are a little higher yields here, but the yield loss was about 827 pounds a yield, okay? So substantial yield loss under drought, all right? Substantial yield loss under drought. Now, I'm gonna show you the next slide here. Um, I guess not the next slide, I had it, it was, I'm jumping ahead. Um, so substantial yield loss, and if we were to look at this crop during flowering, so if we're, we're at a full canopy, we're at peak bloom, something like that, 
you know, this is our well watered crop, this is our drought stress crop, okay? So we generally say if you see wilting, now sometimes you can see wilting and not get a yield penalty, but if you see wilting, especially during peak bloom, right, we generally say that you've already had yield loss that's happening, right? And so this is what the crop looked like at that time. Okay, now the next experiment, um, again, same site, okay, same site. And I'm being deliberately vague here, but we've got dry land, we've got irrigated. We saw a very small but significant, in a different experiment, okay, we saw a very small but significant yield reduction with irrigation. Now this is drastically different results, right? Grown under the same conditions. One, we got a little, little penalty for irrigation. And the other, we have this massive yield reduction under drought, okay? Let's look at another variety. And, and I want you to notice, so we're up here, again, you know, we're going from uh, a really good yield to still a good yield, right? All right, so let's go to the next. This is probably the highest yields we've gotten as an average for an entire trial. You know, we're up here, you know, two and a half bales, something like, or sorry, four and a half bales, and you know, we're seeing still a significant but small yield reduction with irrigation. It's the same experiment as that previous variety. So, what's going on? We've got very different responses to irrigation, but I didn't tell you a whole lot of stuff, right? I kept it vague. There's a lot you should ask. So, I'm just saying dry and irrigated. What are the questions you should ask? What should I know about drought? If I say, yeah. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. The, the short answer is that it's not entirely dry land the whole year, but yeah, we'll get there. Okay, so, so what do I need? So I'm saying dry, right? What, what, what is it you need to know? Like, so if I say drought, the effect of drought depends on what? When did it occur? Timing, right? What else? How much? So severity of drought, right? So if you have some measure of soil water deficit, some indication of the level of drought, right? Severity. What else? Temperature. Okay, temperature will affect it, right? But these are all grown under the same temperature conditions, right? Absolutely. But one more thing I'm looking for, and that is the duration of that drought stress, right? So all three of those things you got to ask to really understand what we're seeing here, right? So I'm going to move forward here. And I want to show you, this is just showing soil water deficit and I, the, the, the dark circles and the light circles. Let's look at those first. Ignore, ignore the ones in the middle for now, okay? So with the, with the light circles, what you see is that's going to be our dry land season long, okay? And then those dark circles, those are going to be ones that we kept well watered all year. We kept it between, you know, an, an 80, 100% full soil profile to, to 80%. We kept that crop pretty well watered the whole year, okay? <clears throat> and so what you can see here is with the, with the dry land season long, okay, when we go into this drought stress period, the crop is already at about a 60% soil water deficit, but the crop looks great, okay? There's nothing, well, like visually, there's no indication of stress, okay, going into the drought stress period. And we always say the crop's only, you know, like a few days away from drought here in Georgia. Well, if you start here at 60% and then we get, the, get a drought stress period, it won't take long for that crop to be under yield limiting drought, okay? Now, this is the one that you saw earlier that was severely wilted and all of that stuff, okay? Now this one. This one is, that, is a dry land treatment. Well, I keep losing the, losing the pointer here. But this, these little upside down triangles here, right? For this one, we kept it well watered all year until we got to about peak bloom there. And then we stopped irrigating. And there was a reason. There's a whole separate trial that I'm not going to discuss here. But um, what we see is as soon as we stop watering, the soil water deficit goes up, 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 right? 
because we're not getting much rainfall. It's hot, the crop's constantly losing water. And this one right here actually yielded better than stuff that we kept wet all year long. So then someone, someone asked me the other day, well that means that we need, to, we need to stress that crop a little bit, you know, as we, you know, uh, at, at certain times during the season, if we could get that down, we'd be, we'd be good to go. But I want to point out something here. Was this crop really stressed, okay? Was the crop really stressed? And so, visually I can tell you there was no stress in this crop the whole time, okay? And not only that, we went out there and we took a few measurements. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk here for a second. So we took measurements at one, two, and three weeks of stress. So stomatal conductance, we have, a, we have this instrument that we can go out and we can measure photosynthesis and we can measure basically stomatal opening and closing. So those pores on the leaf, in response to drought, they'll close, okay, to limit water loss. And that usually penalizes the plant. The plant has lower photosynthetic rates if it's under stress, okay? But I want you to look at something here. Week one, week two, week three, those plants are not closing their stoma. They're not limiting water loss. There is no indication of stress for this for $37.99 the entire time. There's no indication of stress for Stoneville 5091. So stomatal conductance, there's no difference between dry land and irrigated. And then this was the really interesting thing to me, okay? In, in the crop that we stressed for that brief period of time, we started out at week one, there were no differences in photosynthetic rates, but as the so-called stress, which was not stress, <laughs> progressed, um, our photosynthetic rates were actually higher. They were actually higher in the crop that we weren't irrigating, okay? So the crop was doing better. I want to make that clear that this was not a stressed crop. So whenever people, you know, come to me and talk about stress, you know, how are you measuring it? Are you talking about visually seeing stress symptoms? If so, that's a bad idea, right? Because we can penalize yield that way, okay? Um, what about the other variety? When we saw a difference, if anything, the so-called dry treatment was better off. Now that has more to do with the fact that those leaves, um, drought is, I'm sorry, um, growth is one of the more sensitive responses to water availability. So if you pump the water to the crop, it's going to put on new growth, okay? Um, and so just like whenever you put on PGRs, if you put on PGRs, what's a visual indication of, of the application of picks? Not just, okay, plants are different heights, but what else? Green. The, the coloration, right? They're going to be a darker green. That was a similar situation here, all right? So not stressed, and my take-home message with all of this is how the crop responds to drought depends on where it is at the time that that drought stress occurs, okay? The other thing, I get a lot of questions about irrigation termination, right? Can I terminate ir irrigation a little earlier than the recommendation? Should I even trust the recommendation? Um, should I push it further? It depends what your soil water deficit is at the time you make that decision, right? If you don't know that, then you need to go with a safer choice, right? So, um, I've, I had more things that, more, more take home messages there, but I've lost them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop talking and I'll open it up for additional questions at this time. But I think, you know, just like with, you know, if, if you're, you wanna decide where to place a variety, you need to know if you've got nematodes, right? If you're making an irrigation management decision, you need to know what your soil water deficit is. And the way we measured this, it wasn't with any fancy sensors or anything, it's just the smart irrigation app that George Valetis has developed, okay? But if you're gonna use it, you need good rainfall data. You need rainfall data for your field. And there's options to include an automated rain gauge in that app so that you know this is the rainfall you're getting in that field. Now, if you're just gonna pull weather data from a station that's down the road, how accurate do you think that's gonna be for your field? Probably not great, right? All right. Um, so, that's all I got. Have you seen differences in irrigating at night uh, when it's, you know, 75, 80 degrees versus 95 degrees in the afternoon? Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything to take home or 
Yeah, so one of the things we've not really compared, we haven't really done any comparisons of nighttime irrigation versus, for example, daytime, that kind of thing. We don't really, I haven't done any, any research on that. I know Anthony irrigates at night all the time, right? Like that, well, that's, it, that's more, more that's, tied, that's tied to energy costs, right? Or energy something. Energy costs and then like, I mean, people show up, they got to do work, and so he irrigates at night. He irrigates, okay. Yeah. You can yeah. probably put out less at night. Because you're not you're losing not so losing. much due to evaporation, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I, now again, have we compared that? No. Yeah. Any you other? Went, you went into Pete Bloom in pretty good shape on those that, that got drought fit. So where exactly does the cotton plant pull its water from when you get to that position? So we pro probably have pretty good moisture throughout the soil profile, but where is that cotton plant and if you don't have it up top, let's say yep. you got in a drought, how much water is it able to pull from the, from the, yeah. the tap root? Yeah, because all we're assuming, that's the challenge, this model for the soil water deficit. It's assuming a two foot effective rooting depth and that 50% of that's available to the crop, right? Um, we didn't actually measure that. So one of the things we're doing next year uh, in collaborate, also working with uh, our, you know, Preet Verk and others down there, um, is we're going to be looking at, at soil water uptake from different layers of the soil profile. In addition, I believe, I don't want to you know, speak for her, but I believe she's also going to couple that with some root work as well. All right, so again, I don't know that, but we're definitely going to be looking at it. Yes? Yeah. Well, so I get what you're saying there. I think, I mean, are we out of time? No. Okay. So what I would say, well, I know, I know this is kind of what you're talking about here. Let me just say that there's a, there's a pretty big risk associated with that because, so we did this for research purposes, right? We didn't want anything to be, we didn't want to say there's any limitations to water, but the, the trick with doing what you're talking about, I, I, if you have the ability to control this, right, it's great. Maybe we could define specific deficit thresholds that are just ideal, right? But um, what's the challenge? Well, you've got this huge crop, right, with all, with, that's at peak bloom. It's losing water like crazy. And what if something breaks down, right? What if, so if you could, you know, it's great if you could keep everything at a particular deficit level and it works. And let's say you, you, you've got your best yield you can possibly get. But what if, you know, these are all things you've got to be careful of because the potential, you saw the yield loss, right, from drought. So we can't really... If something goes wrong, the, the risk is much higher as well at that stage, right? I mean, else I'd, I'd like to point out that I caught on to this time is that once you got to that point yeah. there at, you know, the beginning of August, you weren't catching up. Yeah, so, there so, no up from that. yeah, so if you look, if you look right there, right, we could probably get it to a certain level, right, and then try to hold it there. But, but again, you could, you could, right? But I want you to see, we got about 80% of a deficit there, and then we irrigated every, I think, couple days, and that's where we stayed, right? We couldn't change it from there. So if something breaks down and you go past that, that's where you're going to stay, right? Like I say, making these decisions, I think start with, if you got this app and you got localized weather data, all I'm saying is it's better to know where you're at, you know, whenever, you know, just because you don't want to get past, a th we know that when you start going, getting up into those higher deficit thresholds, you know, you start getting into trouble because that's a very small difference there, right? But all I'm saying is the level of stress you experience depends, depends on where you're at when that stress starts. And that could affect a lot of decisions, whether it's irrigation termination, or how you want to manage irrigation during that time frame. Um, but yeah, uh, all right. And I also don't think necessarily we need to be throwing the water to it real heavy in the early season, but we've got other data on that that we could discuss at a different time. I, th I don't want to take up everybody else's time. So yeah, I no, you're good. And <laughs> we can talk like out in the hallway and stuff. Real quick, there are commercial and private pesticide uh, hours for the UGA portion of the program. 
those forms are can be found at the registration desk. All right.